I take games very seriously. I have taken games seriously for a long time. The reason I take them seriously is, is because I consider them the intellectual counterpart to sports. I think they, they exercise your brain. I would love to see games raised to the stature of, uh, of intellectual sports. I want to wish you all good luck, and I really want you to have a, have a great time. Okay, so in order to understand the inaugural season of the Magic the Gathering Pro Tour, we gotta set the scene. The year is 1995, Magic is in its third year of existence. In the early days, stores couldn't keep booster packs on the shelves. No one could get enough of this weird math and tracking game that had wizards and dragons on the cards. Alpha, Magic's first set, had a print run of 2.6 million cards, gone immediately. Beta, which for all intents and purposes is alpha but with fixed corners, followed with a 7.3 million card print run, poof, gone, unlimited. Exact same stuff again, but white bordered. 40 million cards printed that stores couldn't carry enough of. And it just kind of went on like this. Now at this point, Wizards of the Coast is a fledgling company. They literally aren't equipped for runaway success, but that's precisely what's happening. So they keep making sets, and those sets keep selling like hotcakes. Eventually, retailers, knowing that they'll only get a percentage of what they order from each new set, start over-ordering sealed product every time a new one's announced. This is relevant because by the time Wizards of the Coast finally prints enough product to meet demand, they will unwittingly saddle retailers with endless booster packs of one of the worst sets of all time. Okay, imagine it's 1993. You own a comic book shop. This game, Magic the Gathering, comes along and you're like, what the hell, let's see if the kids like it. And it turns out, they love it. You can't even keep it on the shelves. Your Wizards of the Coast rep calls you up and says, hey dummy, we got this new Magic expansion set coming out. It's like Aladdin and, I don't know, whatever. Kids are gonna freak out. How many cases do you want? And you're like, eh, how about 25? And then they send you 10. And the packs sell out immediately and then that's it. You never get any Arabian Nights ever again. Same rep calls you up two months later and says, Hey, idiot, Wizards of the Coast, we got another new set. We're on that Indiana Jones this time. The set's going to be nice. How much are you buying? And you're still remembering the Arabian Nights thing, so you're like, I want 50 cases this time. And then they send you 10 again. They sell out in seconds again. And now the kids at your store are like, Hey, when are you getting more antiquities? And at this point, you're annoyed. So you're like, never. Shut up. Leave me alone. But then you feel bad and you apologize to the kid and you give him a thing of Oreos or something because you're not mad at that kid. You're mad at that smug sales rep who keeps calling you names on the phone and not sending you enough product because all this kid wants to do is give you their money, but you can't take it from them because all the wizard squares are gone and you have no idea when you're going to get more. And to make matters worse, Scott and his stupid shop across town has antiquities packs in stock out the ass and it's all very stressful. And then ring, 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 ring. Hello. What's up, dumb, dumb? All right, get this. We literally <laughs> made a set out of some dork's Dungeons and Dragons characters. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> it does not matter. Because these people will literally buy whatever the hell we want to print. And you're like, God, this guy is the worst. But he's got a point. So you go, I'll take 100 cases. And the rep goes, of course you will. And then he hangs up on you. And then you get 25 cases of Legends, which, you know, it's not the amount you ordered. But it's definitely better than 10. And that Oreos kid is happy now. So that's nice. Rep calls you up again and is like, hey, what's up, idiot? Next magic set is Halloween. It's just Halloween. I don't even really know. How much you in for? And you say, give me 200 cases. You get 100 this time. But it all flies off the shelf like every other ludicrous set, so you're feeling pretty good. So then the rep calls you up and they're like, sup, nerd? Next magic set, we're going medieval on them. It's basically a renaissance fair told through the cards. How much can we put you down for? And you're like, give me 400 cases. And the rep's like, um... Are you sure? That's a lot. And you're like, do not patronize me. I know how this works now. And you don't think about it again until 400 cases of Fallen Empires arrives at your doorstep. And then the Oreo kid comes in and he buys three packs of Fallen Empires and he opens them at the counter all excited. But then as they're reading the cards, which takes forever because all these cards have a million lines of text for no payoff, the excitement starts to fade away. And the first thing they say to you is, what the hell is this Philip Seymour Hoffman looking thing? And they shove the card in your face like it's your fault that it exists. And you're like, I don't know. I don't really play this game. And then that kid leaves and never buys another Fallen Empires booster again. 
Now repeat that for every regular that came in to buy magic cards. You're now sitting on a landfill's worth of cards that you're never going to move. That was Fallen Empires. The subsequent sets weren't much better, which really sucks, because even though they printed less of them, there were still way too many of them in circulation. This culminated with Homelands, which is very easily the worst set of all time. Between these uncompelling sets and the Chronicles fiasco that triggered the advent of the reserve list, consumer confidence in Magic was in free fall. It was at this time that Wizards of the Coast brand manager Scaff Elias came up with the Pro Tour. In 1995, the game had two problems. The tournament scene was totally unstructured, and players had no reason to buy the newer, weaker cards. A professional tournament circuit could solve for both. An invitation-only tournament series allowed for Wizards-sponsored qualifier tournaments to be held at LGSs, and a special format of play where sets perpetually rotated in and out based on their release date could bolster interest in new sets. And thus, Standard was born. The place, New York City. The time, February 17th and 18th of 1996. The event, the very first tournament of the Magic the Gathering Professional Tour. 238 of the world's best Magic players arrived in New York City, all hoping to earn the right to call themselves the first professional champion. This is footage ripped from a VHS titled Showdown in New York in commemoration of the first ever Pro Tour. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. The format for the professional tour is designed to keep players on their toes, requiring competitors to adapt to a brand new format premiered at this event. A Type 2 variant, the format required that all decks include at least five cards from each of the available Type 2 sets. Fourth edition, Chronicles, Fallen Empires, Ice Age, and Homelands. As a result, the competitors had a lot of interesting decisions to make. Right, so at the time, Type 2 consisted of Fallen Empires, 4th Edition, Ice Age, Chronicles, and Homelands. And in a tacit admission of just how bad the sets they just pumped out were, Wizards of the Coast hatched a special rule for Pro Tour New York. Every deck list needed to have at least five cards from every standard legal set. But players found loopholes. This is the distribution of cards by set among the top eight decks of the first Pro Tour. Lots of Ice Age, lots of 4th edition, and close to the bare minimum of everything else, including the actual bare minimum of Homelands. As bad as this looks, the reality of the situation was much worse. Each constructed deck comes with a 15-card sideboard separate from the main deck. Because tournaments are played in best of three matches, between games, players can swap out cards in their decks for cards from their sideboard that will give them a strategic advantage in that specific matchup. That is the intended use of a sideboard. Another function of sideboards at Pro Tour New York was that it gave players a place to hide all the toilet cards they were being forced to play. Out of 40 Homelands cards played in the top eight decks from Pro Tour New York, 29 of them, almost 75%, were tucked safely in sideboards, safe from consequence or impact. Along these lines, the other sets didn't fare much better. Ceremonies for this event was none other than Magic the Gathering's designer, Richard Garfield. It's pretty exciting. Um, it's a lot of fun talking to the players, seeing what, uh, what strategies they're evolving and uh, what they think about taking Magic seriously, which is what they're starting to do. These are the two Pro Tour New York finalists, Michael Lacanto and Bertrand Lestre. They're getting interviewed before the finals. They had never met each other before the Pro Tour, but they did get paired in the Swiss rounds. Lestre dealt Lacanto his only loss. And look how cute these guys are! They're best buds! A guy from France and a guy from Massachusetts just pound around over wizard squares. I suppose Luck, chance is uh, has got a, a, a big part uh, at, at this level, you know. Top 16, I guess the change will will make difference. Maybe also the sideboard, you know, good sideboard can do the difference. So I, I mean, I I, I wait and see. I mean, I, I'm quite confident. I mean, I've done I've done what I, I wanted to do to be in the top 16. I like Bertrand Lestray. Of all the people they interview, he's the one that really seems to get it. And he's funny! I understand you're wearing a team t-shirt. Can you show it to us? Yes, of course. I mean, this is a, the, uh, the French team t-shirt. 
and as you can see here, <clears throat> it's written in French, and uh, it says, uh, thank you for giving me money, and on the back... As tempting as it is to look at this footage and the 90s of it all and laugh at how quaint it is, which I certainly did at first, the truth is that this isn't that different from what happens at tournaments at every level now. You're not laughing at how much has changed, you're laughing at how little has changed. Look at this interview from then-Canadian national champion Eric Tam right after Lakanto knocked him out in the corner finals. First game, I really thought I had him. Um, I, I knew he had control magics and counters everywhere. And he, he, he uh, on, a road, on around the fifth turn, I had my quick man out, so I played a Stereo Angel. And he chuckled and he said, all right, I'll control it. But that time, I only had two cards in hand. One was an arm roll, one was a balance. And one was a sword splash. So that's three, sorry. So, um, you know, I swords my own, own angel after he controlled it. He walked right into my trap. Untapped my mana, played a land, balanced, tapped six mana in my pool, made him drop six cards. Played, played the Autumn Willow. I thought, he'd, I thought he'd be toast. I hit him like six times, I hit him like four times. He pulled like a fountain of youth, and then he recalled for a wrath with only white, one white mana, and he drew a white mana on the very next turn, so he just pulled it out with what four hit points left. I thought I had him. Second game, the man's deck is decent. It's quite good. I mean, that copy wouldn't be out of place today. Maybe the terminology got more sophisticated along the way, but the general ideas here aren't unique to 1996. It's just magic. Facing down impending doom, a guy peels runner runner to pull out the match. All that's changed is the set dressing. After watching about five seconds of gameplay, it becomes very clear that you're watching amateurs. There was no professional play before this, so amateurs were all they could be. The unsleeved beta basics alongside revised ivory towers and chronicle zernum gins just served to drive that point home. The board states are a mess. There are cans of coke on the tables. Everyone's keeping track of their life with dice. Look, I know it's a waste of time to pine for life before the internet, but this footage, this enthusiasm, this totally incomprehensible board state could only exist then. Somehow, this thing that isn't trying to appeal to a broad audience is more accessible than pretty much everything Wizards of the Coast put out about the Pro Tour after this. Michael Lakanto overcame an 0-1 deficit in the finals to rally back and win the match and the tournament two games to one. They were supposed to play a best of five, but couldn't because Wizards of the Coast only had the tournament hall till midnight. I'd say you couldn't make this stuff up, but you definitely could. You just wouldn't because it's kind of dumb. God, I love it. The next Pro Tour was in May in Los Angeles. The format was Booster Draft, fourth, fourth Homelands to be exact. They don't really mix core sets with other boosters for drafting anymore, but for this Pro Tour, they probably had to because Homelands had eight card booster packs. Because of that, players built their draft decks from 38 cards as opposed to 42 cards today. On top of that, eight of those cards were from Homelands, so yeah, from a gameplay perspective, Pro Tour LA might be the least fun Pro Tour to ever play in. Gameplay for limited formats is typically defined by the commons in the set, since they're expected to make up the majority of a given deck. This chart shows the makeup of the commons in each color in 4th edition. The set has some issues. Let's dig into the creatures first, since in limited, creatures are going to be the primary way decks win games. The common creatures in 4th edition are pretty puny, so if you're trying to win games, it's going to take a while. 4th edition also suffers from an enchantment problem, which might have been fine if the cards themselves weren't so awful. Let's start with auras. Auras are generally understood to be a liability. If you put an aura on a creature and your opponent kills it with a removal spell, your opponent just traded one of their cards for two of yours, which, if you're trying to win, those kinds of exchanges aren't sustainable. 4th edition has 24 auras at common. Only three of those auras serve as removal, and those are situational at best. The set also has nine global enchantments at common. In addition to the five circles of protection, 4th edition has Fortified Aura and Sunken City, which are unplayable, and Flood and Pestilence, which are absolute bombs. You would take either one over most rares in the set. Putting cards this powerful at common sucks, especially as enchantments, which are tough to interact with at a baseline, but hey, if your goal is to make disenchant really good, then cards like Pestilence and Flood certainly accomplish that. And then, there's the creatures. These stats in the aggregate might not look so bad by themselves, so let's compare these splits to the splits from M21. 
core set just like 4th edition, but one that was developed with limited in mind. The shifts from then to now might not look that impressive, and I get that, especially considering the amount of time that passed between 4th edition and M21, but keep in mind, power and toughness, especially power, live on an exponential scale, not a linear one. Here's what I mean. A one power creature by itself will take 20 turns to kill an opponent. A two power creature, 10 turns, cuts the time in half. A three power creature takes seven turns. A four power creature takes five turns. A five power creature takes four turns. Now we're getting into diminishing returns territory. A six power creature also takes four turns. A seven power creature takes three, but so does an eight or a nine power creature. This is what I mean when I say that not every point of power should be considered equally. Now let's go back and look at those 4th edition M21 splits again. In 4th edition, the average white creature is a 1-1 for 2. In M21, it's a 2-3 for 3. That's a huge leap. You're paying more mana for the privilege, but efficiency only gets you so far. And I would rather cast creatures that can feasibly attack than have my drudge skeletons stare at my opponent's drudge skeletons till the sun burns out. By now, you probably get it. Fourth edition was bad. Limited is a more curated experience now. Hindsight is 2020. Instead of subjecting you to more graphs about how bad Homelands was, let's just pour one out for the poor souls who had to play in Pro Tour LA and move on. Pro Tour Columbus was block constructed. They used to do sets in three set blocks. So for example, Ravnica block is Ravnica, Guild Pact, Dissension. Urza block is Urza's Saga, Urza's Legacy, and Urza's Destiny. Pro Tour Columbus was Ice Age block constructed, which meant there were only two sets legal, Ice Age and Alliances. As far as I can tell, there are only four deck lists from this tournament that exist, belonging to the players who comprise the top four of the Pro Tour. Peter Radoncic, Alvaro Marquez, Sean Fleischman, and the tournament winner, 16-year-old Swede Ole Rade. Now you might recognize Ole Rade as Sylvan Safekeeper, but before all that, he was the Pro Tour Columbus champion piloting a 61-card red-green deck with a loose insect theme and three copies of Ice Age standout Stormbind to tie the room together. Mark Rosewater dubbed his deck Bugbind on the finals footage, and oh yeah, you better believe we have this finals match on tape. This is Mark Rosewater. I'm here with Mark Justice, and we're here at the finals of the third stop on the Magic the Gathering professional tour. On the left, Sean Fleischman of New York. On the right, Ali Raid of Sweden about to play for $22,000. Hell yeah, this footage rules. They're using stacks of paper to present life totals for the camera. Unfortunately, the novelty of how quaint all of this is wears off really quickly because the gameplay on display here sucks. There's not really more to say about it. It's not more complicated. This blows. These are two decks built around Yokel Hops, which is a card that simultaneously ends the game and also drags the game out for about 10 more turns, somehow. Ole Rade played a deck that was, at the time, characterized as aggressive, but look at this creature suite. That is eight two threes for three, five one ones for one, two one threes for three, two zero fours for three, and four deadly insects. In sharp contrast, Sean Fleischman's Thawing Glaciers deck played a bunch of spells that exchange one for one, with all the stuff an opponent does until he can set up Yokel Hops with an Ivory Gargoyle on the battlefield. The most interesting thing that happens during this match happens during game two. It has nothing to do with gameplay. Very little better too. Well, Chairman, every time I draw a card, you sure that's not? Uh, I'll find out. For this? Hang on a sec. Okay. Go. I'm hoping that that's the beta booster draft and not them cheering every time Sean draws a card. Okay. Hold on. That is the beta booster draft over there? Yeah. They're not watching this match? It's just weird because the last two rounds of cheering have exactly coincided with Sean drawing a card, so I just wanted to be sure. Oh, this? Okay. Okay. I, I, I figured that's what it was and it, it, it's just... I don't mind if you don't take a damage. Yeah, what's going on, there's a lot of screaming in the background. We're, we're in the, the main hall, and oh, uh, in, the in the background, there are people screaming, and, and Sean is wondering whether or not they were screaming because there's monitors in the room. They were screaming because of what he drew. 
Opening the level booster. And it turns out that there's a, what we call the beta bonus challenge okay. where Some people get to play a sealed deck with uh, beta cards. And I'm sure somebody just pulled a mox. Someone pulled a mox Someone or a lotus. Someone pulled a time walk. Yeah. So. And so people are excited. Keep. And Tom, being the ever efficient mm. rules aficionado that he is, checked it out. Go okay, check that out. is the beta booster draft. Just okay. very strange timing with your draws. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if you two want to put this on hold until they're done over there, you're more than welcome to. That's okay. Okay. The judge offers to pause the Pro Tour Finals for a side event. God, that's incredible. Okay, to put a beta booster draft in 1996 into perspective, that would be like pausing the finals of the new Capenna Championship or whatever the hell it's called in order to let a Modern Horizons draft finish up. Incredible. Oh, by the way, this Pro Tour was at Origins, and in order to accommodate all the other events going on in the hall, Pro Tour Columbus cut to a top four instead of a top eight. Unreal, absolutely unreal. Ole Rade won, which set the table for the 1996 World Championship. Tom Chanfang won Worlds with an aggressive mono white deck. Best part of his deck list was the sleight of mine in his sideboard that was totally uncastable in his deck. As the story goes, there were supposed to be four copies of Adakar Wastes in his deck. Now, I don't know why you'd want to splash blue for sleight of mind and not literally anything else, but it didn't matter because he couldn't cast it anyway. And with his 14 card sideboard in tow, he won the world championship. And with that, the very first Pro Tour Player of the Year race was decided. Ole Rade would go on to top eight three more Pro Tours, thus earning him a spot in the Pro Tours inaugural Hall of Fame class. Rade only played in two out of four Pro Tours in the 96 season, but he made him count, notching a median finish of 2.5. Aside from Tom Shanfang, who won the only Pro Tour he played in that season and was never heard from again, Rade's median finish of 2.5 puts him in a class all by himself. All in all, it was a fitting end to the first season of the Pro Tour. Or, maybe, it wasn't. Tell me what I missed, and if you enjoyed nerding out over this stuff for five hours, then like and subscribe, and there are two links in the description. One is to buy cards at TCG Player. You're already going to buy your cards there because we have the cheapest prices, but if you want to give Deese the credit for the sale, by all means, use the link. We really appreciate it. Second link is for our subscription service, which I actually designed clear back in 2019 and fully endorse. Okay, that's all the shilling and ad reads I've got this time, so without further ado, Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.